All engine running. <laughs> Absolute genius. Get this. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> this is the show where we bring you science. Going. What that essentially means is discovery, advances, advances. questions, research, technology. Unbelievable. Without further ado, this is the Naked Scientist. Hello, welcome to the programme where we bring you the latest breakthroughs in science, technology and medicine with me, Chris Smith and Adam Murphy. Coming up, a breakthrough in the treatment of people paralysed by spinal injuries, also why we should worry about people using facial recognition to track us, and signs that Covid jabs did alter women's periods, but not very much and not for long. And after doctors transplanted a pig's heart into a human last month, we're dissecting the story of the field of xenotransplantation. What's involved? Is this safe? And will it solve the shortage of donor organs? The Naked Scientist podcast is powered by UKfast.co.uk. First this week, injuries to the spinal cord usually result in permanent disabilities, including paralysis. This is because the spinal cord is effectively a giant bundle of nerve pathways that connect the brain with the motor neurons that make muscles move. Cutting the cord disconnects the two, so signals to move can't make it through. But now, scientists in Switzerland have published results on a system that they've developed to bypass the block. They use electrical implants in the spinal cord controlled by external computer systems to activate those motor neurons directly and restore movement. Julia Ravi spoke to Grégoire Cotin from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, Lausanne, whose team designed the technology, and neurosurgeon Jocelyn Bloch. The spinal cord is disconnected from the brain. So it's anatomically intact, but it's in a silent state. We are inserting electrode array to send electricity and reawaken the spinal cord in order to re-establish the motor functions. You've performed this procedure on several patients. What have been the results from this procedure? So we've implanted nine patients. The first six had an incomplete spinal cord injury, meaning that they still had a little bit of neurological function. And uh, the last three had a complete spinal cord injury. This means that they had no movement, no sensations. And uh, all nine could immediately step after the surgical procedure, but they all needed a, a few months of training in order to be better and better. Is there a a line? Do you think these individuals can get better and better and better with their motor function? Or do you think there's going to be sort of a stop point of where they can improve? So surprisingly, the first patient we implanted with an incomplete spinal cord injury that was in 2016. And he was with us six months. And we still see him every six months and coming from some tests and examination. And we still see progress. So as long as they keep training, we see... Even if it's a slow curve, they keep progressing. So it's hard for us to tell exactly where it's going to stop. One of the recipients of these implants is David MZ, who joins us now. David, how has this procedure changed your life day to day? (laughs) I have an incomplete injury. So now that I have more strength in my right leg and a little bit something in my left one, it makes it, for example, easier to get into my wheelchair when I'm on the floor. So if I go to the lake in summer, I take a swim, I get back, it's much easier to get back in my chair. So it's many things that change, but it's not like I'm walking at home uh, in an everyday life setting. How do you operate the implant itself? The implant is controlled by a tablet. It's It's a little bit cumbersome because the tablet is connected to a device that communicates with another device that communicates with even another device that in the end communicates with the internal pulse generator. But in the end, uh, once the connection is established, I can control the stimulation from the tablet. And then I can increase, for example, the amplitudes that give the signals down to the legs and I can and play with timings and stuff. So once it's all set up, it's, it's a really cool thing. Jocelyn and Gregoire, so far this technology has been used for people who still have a certain length of spinal cord intact. Is there any hope for people who have a different type of paralysis to benefit from this type of technology? What we are conducting as a research trial with Jocelyn is to link the brain to the stimulation. So electrode in the brain to decode the intention and link it wirelessly to the stimulation. A wireless bridge between the brain and the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. 
And when do you think the technology that has been used in these clinical trial patients, when do you think it will be more widely available? When will it be? It's still hard to say. There are still a few ongoing uh, clinical trials, but I hope that within a few, let's say two, two to three years, there will be a product available. You know, to calibrate expectation that you know our patients still live in a wheelchair, so they can stand, they can take a few steps, but it is not a cure for spinal cord injury, right? Our goal is to maximize recovery, improve quality of life, but this is not enough to cure spinal cord injury. David, what would be the next step that you'd love to reach with your training? The next really big step would be to walk hands-free. But I think with only this technology, uh, at least in my case, it, it would be really hard to achieve that. But other things were called impossible before. So um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Brilliant to hear from David and Mzee there, ending that report from Julia Ravy. The study was published in Nature Medicine. Now, when we think about our personal data, we often consider information like phone numbers, our bank details or email address. But what about our eyes, ears, mouths and noses? Facial recognition is increasingly being used to tag and track our individual activities. And while commonplace in unlocking personal devices like laptops and phones, certain institutions are keen to use our features for much more than just mugshots. This includes the US Treasury, who last week actually backtracked on plans for mandatory facial verification for people logging their tax returns. So why are some people wary of firms having their faces on file? Robert Spencer. Face verified. It's a question that appears time and time again. How comfortable are we as a society with facial recognition? As unlocking your phone shows, in some respects, the answer is clear. But when it comes to having your face scanned as you walk down the street, the issue becomes more murky. It's a biometric identifier that means using aspects of your body for identification. The issue is that all of us are walking around in public showing our faces, meaning that anybody with a scanner, if they want to, can mount a camera or whatever it is and use an algorithm to identify us. We don't have any control over who is using our face as the identifier. That's Gareth Mitchell, who presents Digital Planet on the BBC World Service. This lack of control and consent is key to one of the central paradoxes in the discussion around facial recognition, and it speaks to the differences in technologies involved, as Stephanie Hare explains in her new book. There are different types of facial recognition technology, so let's start with facial verification, and that's the kind that you would use to unlock your own smartphone. That's not a very high-risk use of facial recognition technology because the biometric never leaves your phone. A higher-risk example is going to be when the police are using live facial recognition technology to identify people in a crowd. It might be high risk because it can be a chilling effect on free speech if people fear that when they're going to these protests, they're being scanned by the police. But it's not just about giving consent and having control of your biometrics. The algorithms themselves are large, complex computer programs, often hidden behind company secrets. And it turns out they aren't always as accurate as we'd like. It doesn't work as well on people with darker skin. It works particularly poorly on women with darker skin, but it can also be a problem with children, with trans people, with elderly people. The fix, though, might not be as simple as it seems. In order for the algorithms to get better at recognising a whole diversity of faces would mean training those algorithms on more and more faces. And so opponents would say, well, that just adds to the problem. One problem is the algorithms are not very good at identifying a particular group of people. So let's just go and get loads of profiles of of these kinds of people and put them into our databases, well, then you've you know, scanned even more faces, you've potentially um, uh, compromised more people's privacy, and that's made the problem even worse. Police forces around the UK also disagree on the use of the technology known as live facial recognition. The Met uses facial recognition to find offenders on watch lists, but Scottish police have halted its use. Right now, our experience of this technology, who's using it and how it's even discussed in law, differs depending on your postcode. And another reason why facial ID has been so controversial is that some of these police forces have been rolling it out before there was a regulatory framework in effect to protect us and indeed, if necessary, them. This lack of legal framework also concerns Lord Clement Jones, who debated the issue last week in the House of Lords. And the general conclusion was that there was no single 
piece of legislation that really covered the use of live facial recognition. It's very easy to say we need to ban this technology. And I'm not quite in that camp. What I want to see, and this was the common ground, we want to see a review. Uh, we want to see uh, what basis there should be for legislation. Uh, we want to see how the technology performs. And then we want to be able to decide whether we should ban it or uh, whether there are some uses to which it could be put with the right framework. It's hard to ignore the distinct advantages facial recognition carries. It's fast and hands-free. The ability to accurately and instantly identify a fugitive in a crowd would make the world a safer place. There's bound to be a trade-off between uh, our liberties and our security. We should be having conversations that are diverse, where a wide range of people are coming to the table with their views and their issues. I would want to be hearing from scientists, the people who manufactured this tech, from the military, from the police, from medical professionals, from civil liberties groups. And I think it's a, you know, the first step on a long journey that we have to have in the United Kingdom. Lord Clement Jones is optimistic. The public ought to take away from this debate that there are a great many parliamentarians concerned about the use of new technology without proper oversight. But they should put pressure on their own MPs um, to say, well, what is happening much more seriously? It's clear then that we need to have this discussion sooner rather than later. In the meantime, though, I'm going to keep using my face to unlock my phone. I'm not sure where the line in the sand is, but for me, it's a bit past this level of convenience. Well, it sounds like we might soon have to face the music with that one. Robert Spencer reporting there. From baffling British weather... The sideways spines of the vertebrae coming off here... ...to looking at a cheetah from the inside out... Games making their way to the clinic and what to eat in your garden. Mm. The Naked Scientists In Short podcasts bring you a top-up of short, compelling science stories. Listen and download for free at nakedscientist.com slash short or subscribe to Naked Specials wherever you get your podcasts. Still to come here on The Naked Scientist, how close are we to using animal organs for human transplantation? Well, thanks to the exciting recent developments in the world of xenotransplantation, the answer is it might not be too far away. Ova jabs do affect women's periods, but only to a minor degree and only temporarily with no long-term impact. That's the conclusion of a number of studies that were set up last year to investigate reports from some women of menstrual changes in the immediate wake of receiving COVID vaccines. We reported last year that this investigation was underway, so it's a pleasure to be able to circle back and speak again with Imperial College's Vicky Mail, who works on the interactions between the immune system and reproductive systems. She explained what was going to happen. Now she's here to tell us what's been found. As the vaccines were rolled out last year, particularly as they were rolled out to younger age groups, people started talking about noticing changes to their periods after they'd had the vaccine. And quite a few reports, about 35,000 by last autumn, had been made to our vaccine safety monitoring scheme, the yellow card. And the same sort of thing was happening in the United States of America, as a result of which the National Institutes of Health put aside um, $1.67 million dollars to do more research into this, to find out if there was a real link. And um, some of those studies have now started to report. How did they investigate? One of the NIH-funded studies that reported just a couple of weeks ago used data that people were inputting into a menstrual cycle tracking app. So this is really nice because people were inputting their data in real time. And also, these people were using the app to help track and control their fertility. So they were really motivated to put in correct data because it would have a real impact on them. There were about 4,000 people in this study, of whom 2,400 were vaccinated, and the rest acted as unvaccinated controls. After the first dose, they saw no effect on the subsequent period. But after the second dose, there was on average about half a day's delay to the subsequent period. So a change, but a small one, and definitely very small compared to natural variation. But the people who really noticed something were those who had both doses in the same cycle. And of course, this is something that doesn't happen in the UK because of at interdose interval. But they had more than a two-day delay on their next period. 
But it's really important to know that even these people who had a two day delay on the period after they'd had both vaccines in the same cycle, their periods were back to normal within two months. What about the other study? So there was another study in Norway, which looked at almost 6,000 people, all of whom had been vaccinated. And they asked them to recall their periods before and after the vaccine. They did notice that about seven and a half percent of people in an unvaccinated cycle would call their period heavier than usual. But about 13 and a half percent of people in a vaccinated cycle would call their period heavier than usual. And that was a significant difference. So again, here we have a change, which in this case is heavier than normal periods, but it's reasonably small compared to normal variation. I suppose one very important comparison would be to say, well, what happened if a person in that situation actually caught COVID? What does that do to your menstrual cycle? Yes, I think this is also a really important point. So studies that have looked at how COVID affects the menstrual cycle haven't been designed in the same way as these. So we can't compare them exactly. But there have been two which find that change in menstrual cycles after COVID is between 15 and 25 percent of people who caught COVID. So actually, that's quite a large possibility that you'll experience a change if you get COVID. Why do we think this is happening? And should a person be worried about this? So neither of these studies have really done anything to address the potential mechanism. Although as an immunologist, I do think it's quite interesting that you don't see anything after the first dose, but you do after the second dose. And when something happens more the second time than the first time, that's so often a sign that the immune system is involved, which of course probably shouldn't be surprising here. Vaccines are designed to work with the immune system. So to me, that suggests that this is an immune mediated mechanism. And we do know that the immune system can crosstalk with sex hormones. And of course, it's sex hormones that are driving the menstrual cycle. So that could be one way that this is happening. Another way that this is ha- could be happening is because we know that there's a really rich uh, immune system in the lining of the uterus, which helps to control the buildup and the breakdown of the lining of the uterus. Uh, and so it's possible that a big stimulation of the immune system could affect what's going on temporarily there, too. These, to me, are the most likely hypotheses, but definitely in terms of the take home message, the changes that we're seeing are really small compared to natural variation. They reverse quite quickly. So I wouldn't want this to put anyone off getting their COVID vaccine. Thanks to Vicky Mail. When you have a nasty cut or a graze, you naturally go to treat your wound. Now, this might include whacking on some antiseptic or applying an analgesic cream and wrapping it up in a plaster. But one family has recently been found using something of an unconventional approach. Harry Lewis heard all about it from Simone Picker and Lara Southern, who are at the University of Osnabrück. So in this video, you'll see uh, the mother. She sits up and she reaches out and she grabs a small object from under a leaf, which she then moves to her mouth and then moves to the wounded foot of her son. And she repeats these last motions a few times, going from her mouth back to the wound of her son, in essence, treating him. And what is Susie reaching out to grab? What we know at the moment is that this is a flying insect. We haven't identified the species yet, because if you watch closely at what Susie is doing, then so she's catching it, she's putting it into her mouth, And probably there are two things she's doing here. First of all, she might be immobilizing it, that the insect is not just flying out of her mouth, but she's also, it seems she's pressing it. So she is probably maybe pressing something out of it, and then she's putting it into the wound. And sometimes they also, they take it out of the wound again, put it again in the mouth, squeeze it again, and then reapply it. But this means after an insect application event, there's not much left of these tiny little insects. And so far, so far, we haven't been able yet to identify this. Okay, and we should probably let everyone in on the secret, shouldn't we, Simone? This is actually a group of chimpanzees, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so so chimpanzees, they live in a so-called fission fusion system. So meaning they are not always together. We have at the moment in our recumbo group around 45 individuals with adult males, females and their offspring. But then during the day, the chimpanzees, they split up in smaller parties. 
And so what you see here is a little party. It's just Susie with her family. But later in the clip, then there's another female and a male joining who want to look what has happened. So we think that it's for a medicinal purpose. But have we seen this elsewhere? Is this completely brand new? Actually, self-medication is quite widespread in across a lot of animal taxa. And even in chimpanzees, other subspecies of chimpanzees, they do self-medicate with plants by digesting certain plants and leaves. And this is thought to deal with intestinal parasites. But this is the first time that we've ever seen any kind of um, topical application of any kind of animal matter to a wound specifically. I I assume that by putting it to the mouth, either disabling it or squashing it, they're releasing the the active ingredient. We looked into the literature and actually there's a huge literature on substances in insects or their larvae. And these um, substances, they range from antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral to anti-inflammatory and even just soothing substances. And um, so we think that there is really the potential that maybe they go for insects which have these substances. But to really understand this, we first have to identify the insects and then we have to investigate and analyze the involved substances. And I'm assuming as well, Simone, that this isn't something that is just a one off. You've seen this happen more than once. Has it spread outside the troop or is it very much within just this family of chimpanzees that we see it? During the last 15 months, we recorded 76 different wounds. And in 25% of these cases, the chimpanzees caught insects and applied them to the wound. So at the moment, we think that this is a phenomena which the majority of our individuals are using. So we saw it in 22 different chimpanzees of our 45 chimpanzees. From what we've already discussed, I know that you don't know what the insect is. Are there any guesses at this stage? Yeah, we can narrow it down a little bit to a flying one. And also, for instance, maybe you even um, have seen this already or other people when you're out there and you have a wound and then there's some liquid coming out of this, then there are insects who really like to land on the wound. So if we speculate a little bit about how such a behavior um, was invented, then of course it just could be possible that it was just one of these Uh, flies landing on the wound and they want to uh, get something out of the wound and then maybe the chimpanzee tried to chase it away but smashed it it landed in the wound and then maybe there was a direct effect uh, which was soothing his pain so that could be a possible scenario but (laughs) we don't know and uh, maybe it's something different and I hope we will find out soon. Well, I don't think we're going to be trading bandages for bugs in the hospital anytime soon, but it is incredible to see that new behaviour described in these so well-studied animals. That was Harry Lewis, and that research he was reporting on was published this week in Current Biology. Much has changed for business owners, managers and staff recently. But with over 30 years' experience in telecommunications, award-winning independent company Spitfire have the expertise to make sure you stay ahead and can keep on innovating. Whether it's connectivity, MPLS networks, firewalls, or phone systems, Spitfire can help. To find out more, go to spitfire.co.uk. That's spitfire.co.uk. Spitfire, telecoms and IP engineering solutions for business since 1988. Music in the program is sponsored by Epidemic Sound. Perfect music for audio and video productions. Now, for the rest of the programme this week, we are going to talk about an extraordinary medical procedure that was carried out earlier this year. In an American operating theatre, a moment in medical history. This is remarkable, truly remarkable medical news. A man with a life-threatening heart disease successfully received a pig's heart, genetically modified to behave more like a human's. Doctors in Maryland were granted a special dispensation by the US medical regulator to carry out the procedure. But his doctors will have to monitor his immune system for weeks. We have the mastermind behind the Xenotransplantation Project with us and we'll get to catch up on how patient David Bennett is getting on slightly later on. That's right. This week we are looking at how the science of xenotransplantation plays out, moving organs from animals into us humans. 
But let's row back slightly and find out actually what's involved in the first place in transplanting organs and what's its history. Cambridge University transplant surgeon Chris Watson joined Adam earlier in the week to wind the clock back to the start of the 20th century and how it all began. Let's take you right back to 1902. Hungarian Emmerich Ullmann transplants the kidney of a dog into another dog. He later repeats the process but places the kidney of a goat into a dog. The first record of xenotransplantation, cross-species transplantation. Well, we didn't get very good results from this. And one of the problems was the technique of joining blood vessels hadn't really been sorted out. Jaboulet and, and Carell in France that pioneered that. 31 years later, Yuri Voronoi from Ukraine took what was learned and carried out the first human transplant. However, having used a cadaver that had been deceased for a few days prior to the procedure. The patient soon ran into complications, which we have learned from since then. And nowadays, when we take organs out, we, we flush them with an ice cold preservation solution, then we can keep kidneys for 24, 36 hours and, and get good results from them. We can keep livers for, for 12 hours. Hearts even more sensitive, and we can keep hearts for, for probably four hours. Back then, it wasn't really clear where a renal transplant should go. When Ullman did his a goat into dog, he put it in the scruff of the neck of a dog, a lot of spare flesh there, he could put a kidney in. Voronoi put it into the thigh of a patient, and the benefit of the thigh was the blood vessels are very superficial, and you can watch how much urine it produces, because you can bring the ureter, the tube that drains urine from the kidney, out onto the surface of the leg, and you can watch the urine drip down. Of course, that's not a very um, long-lasting solution, because you, you get infection going back up into the kidney. Yuri's patient only survived two days, and it wouldn't be until the early 1950s when René Cous, Charles Dubot and Marceau Cervel carried out a series of renal transplants that some components of the procedure we know today would begin to fall into place. At that time, the French were using kidneys from donors that had been guillotined. These were criminals who had been sentenced to death and were guillotined, and then their kidneys were removed. Having got fresh kidneys and implanted them, they still had a problem that the kidneys didn't work. They, they worked for a few hours and then, then they failed. And what they hadn't appreciated was this process that we call rejection. This is something that um, had been identified as a possible problem back uh, during the war years by uh, a scientist called um, Peter Medower. So rejection was clearly a problem that had to be overcome. Um, but rather overcome it, the, the next pioneer was a gentleman called Joseph Murray working in Boston in the States. And he had some identical twins, one of whom had kidney failure, one of whom was fit and well. Um, so given that they're identical, there was no immune, immunological difference between them. So he was able to take a kidney from one twin and put it into the, to the next twin. And that continued until the 60s, where chemical immunosuppression was started to be used, pioneered actually by a surgeon in, in my own hospital here, um, Sir Roy Khan, who's long since retired, but he developed both azathioprine and metallocyclosporin as immunosuppressants, which is what allowed transplantation to take off and allowed us to do successful livers, hearts, lungs, as well as getting good results from kidneys. So, success. But then, as now, Sir Roy Khan couldn't find enough donors for the number of patients sitting on that waiting list. So currently we've got around about 6,000 people waiting for an organ of some, some type in the UK. 4,500 are waiting for a kidney. Adults waiting for a kidney, there are 100 children waiting for a kidney, 250 waiting for a lung, 300 are waiting for a, um, a heart, and about 600 waiting for a, for a liver transplant. So we do about 4,000 transplants a year. If you're waiting for a kidney, then you can wait and be kept reasonably healthy on dialysis. If you're waiting for a, a liver or a heart or a lung, then you don't have long to wait before you become too sick. So there is a significant mortality, a significant rate of dying in patients while they're waiting. And that's about 10% if you're on the liver transplant waiting list, as high as 25% if you're waiting for a lung transplant. If you do receive your transplant, your life is still dictated by your new organ. And immunosuppression, you need to take tablets daily for as long as the transplants last, or, or in the case of a heart, lung or liver, for the rest of your life. And those tablets have their own side effects, and they also have adverse effects. So... Being immunosuppressed puts you more at risk of infections, and being immunosuppressed also makes you more at risk of certain sorts of cancer, particularly cancers where there may be a viral etiology. 
As you can imagine, for those with vulnerable immune systems, the last two years have caused even more disruption, having to shield consistently from the coronavirus. On top of this, both the number of donors and transplantations carried out have decreased by a third as a result of the pandemic. If you remember, most of the ITU beds were full of patients with COVID. We weren't sure whether COVID would be spread to, to patients having a transplant. The likelihood is we thought it could be. And therefore, the last thing we want to do is to give a, a viral infection to someone and start them on immunosuppression. The other problem was many of these transplants require patients to go into an intensive care unit for a short period afterwards. Livers, hearts and lungs do, for example. And there were no intensive care unit beds. So of the 23 kidney transplant programmes in the UK, 21 closed for a period of time during that first lockdown when, when COVID was really severe. Chris Watson, and interestingly, before the turn of the century, traffic accidents accounted for the majority of donors, but with improved road safety. These days, donors are increasingly middle-aged individuals who have died of other common conditions. As Chris Watson mentioned, people waiting for kidney transplants can be supported using dialysis. This is the situation confronting Joel. The particular condition I have is called IgA nephropathy, um, for many people, uh, it just sort of is something that needs to be monitored and never never really kind of interrupts their lives. I basically then got unlucky a few years later, much more recently, in that it was causing my kidneys to completely fail. And I guess that was the point for which for me was was quite hard. And, and yeah, there were some some tears shed. But yeah, I guess, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's just what there is. You have no choice but to face it, you know. Mm. For those who require it, dialysis like this can take over their life. It certainly, it puts pressure on every, or kind of all aspects of your life. Um, for, for those of us who are working in particular, um, you know, it's, it's, you're actually kind of robbed of, of decades of, of life potentially, um, because essentially dialysis can't replace the full function of a kidney. And, and there's all sorts of other complications, like you have weaker bones, so they tend, we tend to get kind of fractures more easily. We have dietary restrictions that are a real pain. We also have, um, so I personally don't, I probably will at some point in the future, but many dialysis patients have um, fluid restrictions. Now, in Joel's case, he's currently using what is called peritoneal dialysis, where a cleansing fluid is pumped into the abdominal cavity to soak up the waste material from the bloodstream that the kidneys would normally remove. This is later on drained away and replaced with fresh fluid. Patients usually do this at home, but repeating the process several times a day is very inconvenient and it takes a lot of time. Um, that's my metal tray. I've got my other items, clamps, my caps and my shields. And I'm also going to need um, the actual bag of fluid, the lysate. I've been warming this up for the past few hours because it's mid-February and if you put cold fluid into your abdomen, it hurts like hell. So the bag itself, I'll describe it for you, has it's basically a bag of fluid attached to a tube, and that tube is going to connect to the end of my catheter, which comes out of my abdomen. And see, okay. And I need to drain myself out. And taking with it uh, all of the bad stuff, the urea uh, and potassium and various other toxins. This is where we just wait. So I'm nearly completely drained out. I am paying attention because I get something called drain pain, which is where if it drains out completely, I get a kind of sharp pain and I can avoid it if, if I'm really careful and shut it off just before it comes. A glimpse there into the laborious and very delicate dialysis Joel has to carry out repetitively whilst on the waiting list um so i hopefully will at some point in the next year or two receive a kidney transplant from a human in this case and that it will be transformative 
And it would indeed, but the lack of suitable donor organs means patients can wait years for a transplant and some may not survive before they get one. Scientists are trying to develop ways, therefore, to grow replacement human organs in the lab. And surgeons like Chris Watson, whom we heard from earlier, have been developing ways to increase the numbers of donor organs that are fit to be transplanted. But in the meantime, researchers are turning to animals, and particularly pigs, as one way to address the shortfall. But despite their similarity in organ size and function, there are some significant hurdles that need to be overcome before we can use pigs as donors. One concerns infections that could spread from the animals to us humans, and we'll hear how scientists have addressed that problem in a moment. The other major issue is how to persuade the immune system to tolerate tissue that is clearly not human. Columbia University immunologist Megan Sykes has been a pioneer in this area. She's developed ways to reprogram the immune system to regard pig parts as our friends, not foes. And I asked her what happens to transplanted tissues if we can't control the immune response. We all have antibodies that recognize pig cells, and those are called natural antibodies. That doesn't exist against other human tissues and cells unless we've had some prior exposure. There are also other parts of the immune system, like the T cell response that exists for any foreign tissue or organ that is quite strong against xenografts. And finally, there are what we call innate immune responses from cell types that we call natural killer cells and macrophages that are particularly powerful against xenografts. So what happens, Megan, if we put just a piece of animal tissue, an animal organ, into a human and we, we just let the immune system do what it does normally without any kind of drug control or anything? Well, if there was no drug control and say it was a pig organ and no genetic modifications had been performed, then antibodies in our circulation would immediately bind to the cells lining the blood vessels of that pig organ. And that antibody binding would initiate a very dramatic process called hyperacute rejection. And within minutes to hours, those blood vessels would be clotted off and the organ would not have any blood flowing to it and it would die. And there were some transplants done initially with non-human primates. And these same dramatic antibody effects don't happen in those combinations. But of course, there are many problems with using non-human primates as an organ source. Some of them are endangered species. There are ethical problems with using them. And there are many infectious risks associated with using non-human primates. So that's pretty much being discounted. The pig, on the other hand, it's closer to being the right size, especially if you use miniature pigs, which we have in our center. And they have similar physiology to humans. And the risks are actually much more manageable. How have you therefore sought to overcome what the immune system naturally wants to do to foreign tissue like pig tissue then? Our approach really began with the development of nuclear transfer techniques with the famous sheep Dolly uh, back around the turn of the century. And in the early 2000s, we and another group were able to use that approach to knock out of the pig genome, a gene that creates a critical enzyme that creates a critical target that is seen by the vast majority of those natural antibodies that bind to the cells lining the blood vessels. So by making this early genetic modification to eliminate this enzyme, we eliminated that target on the endothelial cells of the pig. And that was a big step. Our group is working on inducing immune tolerance, not only the ones that are targets of antibodies, but also the targets of T cells and natural killer cells. So in essence, then, you are both blinding the immune system to the presence of the, the new tissue because you remove from it targets that it would normally regard as hostile. And at the same time, you then 
introduce the new material to the immune system saying, no, this is friend, not foe. How do you persuade the immune system that this is friend, not foe? Well, we have two methods. One involves removing from the recipient the organ that produces T lymphocytes. That organ is called the thymus and putting in the thymus from the pig. So in that pig thymus, the T lymphocytes learn that the pig, as well as the human recipient, are both self. Can I throw a spanner in the works and say, well, if you're putting pig tissue in, even if it's a thymus, how do you stop the thymus being rejected before it persuades the immune system it's all right? Good question. You have to eliminate the T lymphocytes that are already there in the body so that you're starting with a clean slate. I'm with you. And what was the second step? With the second approach, we can actually educate the B cells as well as the T cells to think that anything on that pig is self, so that these lesser targets of antibodies are no longer targeted because the B cells that see those targets get tolerized as well. I mean, obviously, the long term goal is we grow new organs for people tailor made to them or at least compatible with them. And we don't need to dip into animal reservoirs to solve our problem. But in the near term, do you think that this has legs, this approach using very physiologically similar animals like pigs? I do. I I think it has legs. I think that bioengineering is making great progress and stem cell biology is making great progress, but the complexity of making a functioning organ from scaffold and cells has not yet been surmounted. It's going to work one day, but that day is quite far off. And, you know, by that time, we may have really worked out tolerance to pig organs so well that that will be routine and that will solve the problem. Megan Sykes there. We are exploring the subject of xenotransplantation, using organs from animals like pigs to replace the diseased human equivalent. In a minute, we'll hear about the man who recently received a pig heart when his own failed. But first, we're going to look at one of the other major risks of moving intact animal organs into humans, how we can safeguard against infection. Because lurking in the animal's DNA are viruses, which can reawaken in the immunosuppressed patient and begin to infect human cells with unknown consequences. Harvard's George Church has found a way to track down the genetic signatures of these viruses and remove them. So the viruses in the pig genome, uh, these endogenous retroviruses, have been inherited since probably the dawn of mammals, uh, if not earlier. And unfortunately, humans are not resistant to these particular pig viruses. We and others have shown that they will replicate in human cells. Now, whether that is a health risk is not known yet, but I don't feel so lucky that I would want to take a risk that one out of 100 patients would get sick and possibly spread that virus to their family. So your concern would be if we were to just put an organ from, say, a pig into a human, including an immunosuppressed human, so they're already fighting with one immune arm tied behind their back, that these viruses lurking in the pig tissue, despite not being human viruses, could nevertheless come out of the pig tissue and begin to infect the human tissue in the new host the organ is in. Exactly. We've shown that these viruses will replicate in human cells We have not yet shown that they replicate in human beings. And how many of these viruses are there lurking inside the pig DNA? They range from about 20 to 80 per genome. And we have established methods that are available to anyone to eliminate all of them. And we've shown in peer-reviewed papers that we, we have eliminated all of them from several strains. How do you do that? So we use a new method that we helped work in mammalian cells, which is called CRISPR. And CRISPR is an enzyme that will, when introduced into the pig cells, will edit every copy that is directed to edit. This also works in human cells and is the basis for a variety of therapies. But in this case, we're engineering the pig germline so that when they breed like regular pigs, from from that point on, all of their offspring will be virus-free. So in essence, you've, you've got gene editing tools that can go and 
ferret out where these viruses are in the genome and remove them? Does it remove them entirely or does it just remove enough of them that they're no longer a threat? We could remove them entirely, but they have actually some positive functions. So what we do is we remove their ability to replicate, but we don't remove all their genes. And is there no danger then if you've left the vestige of the virus behind that something could come along and restore the bit you've taken out so it regains the ability to to grow? If something came in from outside, they wouldn't have to restore it. They would already be a risk in and of themselves. But the thing that we've left behind actually protects them from that outside invasion. It's a membrane protein, something that coats the cells, the pig cells, and prevents them from getting infected by other retroviruses of this this category. And there's no danger through doing the gene editing that you introduce changes that you don't foresee or plan for, and then you've solve one problem, but potentially left lurking another booby trap in there. There is that possibility. And that's why it's nice that we're doing it in pigs before we do human. We get to observe the pigs growing up and breeding and and show that generation after generation, everything's fine. And only then do we uh, transplant them into into humans. And where's this going to go next then? So you're in a position where you have created these pigs and they lack these, what could be regarded as an infectious threat were we to use their organs. Are they a kind of foundation now then where we can make further changes or tweaks or build on that foundation to use these as the starting stock of animals that could be donors for organ transplants? Yes, we have uh, published on pig strains that have up to 42 changes in their genome, which have all the immunological tricks that Megan told you about earlier, coagulation, they have uh, antiviral strategies all in place. And they've been tested for hundreds of days in primates, which is much longer than any of the human trials so far. And they will be transitioning to human clinical trials very soon. So there's no barrier to anybody doing similar things in their favorite strain of pig. Are you optimistic? Um, Yeah, I'm very optimistic. It's not only going to help us with the organ transplant deficit, the the, uh, lacking of adequate donors, but it will actually give us uh, organs that are enhanced slightly relative to human organs in that being resistant to certain human diseases and possibly uh, eventually engineered to be senescence and cancer resistant as well. Thanks there to George Church at Harvard University. We are now very lucky to speak with Mohamed Mohiuddin, Director of the Cardiac Xenotransplantation Programme at the University of Maryland, where the first genetically modified pig heart was successfully transplanted into a person. How's the patient doing, Mohamed? Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. The patient is doing reasonably well. The progress is slow, but is uh, according to the plan. The transplanted heart is doing excellent. It's not showing any signs of rejection. We did a biopsy yesterday and it came out very clean, which means that there is no signs of rejection. So backtracking slightly, tell us a bit about this patient and why he ended up in the situation where he needed a pig heart. So, I mean, this patient was admitted uh, to our hospital two months before the transplantation. His heart uh, has gone through failure. And our heart failure team determined that he is not a candidate for a human transplant, mostly because of his non-compliance. He has not taken good care of himself, has never taken medicine or gone to doctor to uh, take care of himself. And for the last two months, uh, you know, he was also on a machine, which is called ECMO machine, that serves as an artificial heart. So, I mean, this patient was definitely denied of a heart transplant from a human, not only from our institution, but from several other institutions. And for that reason, he was willing to accept the risk that would have gone along with with having a pig transplant. How was that even broached? Because presumably he didn't bring this up. Did someone on your team say, well, look, we are working on this. Would you like to try it? 
Yeah, I mean, so he has shown a motivation to live. He always asked if I can get a human heart. We offered him uh, that we are doing an experimental procedure where in our baboon models, we have shown good results of a pig heart with 10 genes surviving for a long period of time. And we would like to test it in you if you allow. And he agreed to it. When you do the procedure, is it very similar to the way we currently do human heart transplants where we recover the organ from the donor it's then rapidly brought to where the recipient is and then just literally plumbed in you take the old one out and put the new one in the procedure is exactly the same if you don't know that uh, what's underneath the drapes you will think that there's another human donating heart but in this case there was a little bit difference the heart once taken out from the pig was put into this perfusion machine where it was perfused with a special fluid while taking it to the human OR where it was put in. There was some disparity between the heart sizes, but that was adjusted by the expert team of surgeons we have. In my experience, having you know done this sort of work myself in the past, it's very important to get a heart that's not too big or not too small for the size of the patient, because otherwise you're asking too much of it or, or basically trying to cram something that's too big into something that's not designed to fit it. How do you overcome that? Yeah, so I mean, since this patient had this condition which causes the heart to dilate, so when we opened his chest, his heart was found to be a little bigger than than the pig heart. But the surgeons that performed the surgery include my partner, Barclay Griffith. Uh, We were able to, you know, uh, adjust that uh, difference and the heart worked perfectly. And how are you keeping the patient well? How are you controlling the immune response? Because the heart you've used, we've heard from Megan and George about how it's been manipulated to make sure it's in, it's friendly to the immune system and doesn't pose an infection risk. But obviously there's the patient's own immune system to contend with. How do you make sure that the heart isn't attacked by the patient's immune system? Yes, so we are using immunosuppression, but to a very minimal amount. My work has targeted a pathway that uh, prevents the crosstalk between the B cells and T cells. And as Megan described, both are very important components in in, um, attacking the the graft. So with this antibody that blocks that crosstalk, we have been able to get good results in our non-human primate model. And it's uh, it's translating very well in, in this patient also. It was more than a month ago now, and the person is still doing okay. You must be very buoyed up by this. Of course, of course. I mean, you know, this is like a dream come true. Does this mean then that pretty much any organ in that pig could be transplanted, the kidneys, the liver, other things that we really struggled to provide for patients? Of course. I mean, you know, that's why we use the 10 gene pig and and another group in Alabama and uh, and New York will be using uh, kidneys from the similar pigs and trying to do kidney transplant, the same pig can be used for liver and other organ transplants. So that's the point of making the a pig, uh, one pig for all organs. Mohammed, thank you very much. And we wish you luck with the rest of the research. That's Mohammed Mahiuddin. Isn't that an amazing outcome? And I hope we have brought you full circle here listening to this programme this week where we've started with transplantation over 100 years ago to the situation where we're now able to move organs from other animals into humans and they don't get rejected. It's incredible, isn't it, Adam? And finally, turning over a new leaf, understanding how plants cope with extra cold winters in Christoph's question of the week. James Titko employs the help of Howard Griffiths. Why don't plants freeze to death during winter? A great question. The stakes are high for plants in the winter, which are desperately trying to avoid ice crystal formation and the subsequent disruption of vital cellular functioning. To explain exactly how they avoid succumbing to a frosty grave, this week's guest is Howard Griffiths, Professor of Plant Ecology at the University of Cambridge. Over to you, Howard. Plants from cooler temperatures have a number of mechanisms which allow them to get used to lower temperatures. As winter approaches, their metabolism adjusts and plants become hardened to the cooler conditions during autumn. And how do they do it? Well, to avoid chilling damage, plants change the composition of cell membranes and incorporate shorter, unsaturated fatty acids, exactly the ones that are good for us. These changes prevent the membranes from becoming more solid or gel-like and help to maintain normal metabolism. So, eating your greens is even more beneficial in winter due to the plant's anti-chill techniques. 
But what about freezing? In order to avoid damage from ice crystals during freezing, many of our plants shed their leaves in winter, becoming deciduous. For the plants which keep their leaves, they can tolerate freezing temperatures by super cooling, which can protect plants down to about minus 12 degrees centigrade. This prevents what's known as nucleation, the first step in ice formation. Super cooling, nucleation. You'd be forgiven for thinking these were processes going on in some sprawling thermal power plant. But this is all going on inside the most ordinary plants we encounter every day. It's essentially the same thing as when we add antifreeze chemicals to our car radiators and salt to de-ice roads. These solutes help to lower the temperature at which water freezes. Plants also accumulate extra solutes in their tissues and can make specific antifreeze proteins or cryoprotectants which prevent ice formation and help to lower the freezing point of cell tissues. That's why you shouldn't walk over a lawn while the grass is still white with frost. The grass underfoot may be super cooled with your clumsy steps disrupting this delicate process, causing ice crystals to form and putting an end to the poor grass's resistance. And these processes have added benefits for humans as well. Maple syrup, for example, is made from a sugar solutions, which maple trees use to repair and refill their water transport cells, xylem, after surviving a long, cold winter. The sweet taste of victory. Well, Christoph, I hope that answers your question. Plants have a few ways to beat the chill, from changing the makeup of their membranes by incorporating shorter, unsaturated fatty acids, to lowering the temperature at which water freezes within them via additional solutes. It's all rather remarkable, isn't it? Thank you to Professor Griffiths from the University of Cambridge for helping us with this question of the week. Next time, we'll be answering Sal's question. Is the behaviour of school students affected by moon phases? Do you know the answer or have you got a question that you want us to solve? If you'd like to get involved, you can join the debate on our forum, thenakedscientists.com slash forum, or email chris at thenakedscientists.com. Join us next week where we will be looking into the history of microscopy and we will be walking around our own immune systems. So that's definitely something to take a closer look at. The Naked Scientists comes to you from the University of Cambridge's Institute for Continuing Education and is supported by Rolls-Royce. I'm Adam Murphy. Thanks for listening. And until next time, goodbye.